Welcome to the Fibromyalgia Podcast with me, Health and Wellness Editor, Verity Clark. Fibromyalgia is a chronic pain condition which goes largely undiagnosed and for which there is currently no cure. Yet in the UK alone, it is estimated that around 1.5 million people are sufferers. Poor diagnosis and zero cure means suffering and silence is a common theme in the chronic pain community. Created in conjunction with the Fibromyalgia magazine, this podcast aims to break this silence because we believe that the more we share, the more ways we will discover for fibromyalgia sufferers to lead happier, healthier lives. We'll be covering and oversharing everything you ever wanted to ask about fibromyalgia, but didn't know who or where to turn to, with conversations with some of the most interesting and thought-leading people, both within as well as outside of the fibromyalgia space, to give you information, insight and inspiration for diagnosing and coping with fibromyalgia. Because even though something is invisible, that doesn't mean it should be kept in the dark. This week, I'm talking to Grace Sparrow, a 33-year-old chef based in Mallorca. Prior to settling in the Mallorca mountains, Grace was whizzing around the world and whisking up delicious dishes as a private chef for the actor Amelia Clark, as well as a spell in the busy kitchen of Sky Gillenhall's restaurant, Spring, in London. Now, Grace is the chef at her family's restaurant, Patiki Beach, in the port of Soyer, and whilst the restaurant may be closed for the winter season, Grace is still conjuring up body and mind nourishing creations to feed private clients. Eating well and keeping active have long been top priorities for Grace. So it was a shock when in February of last year, just before the world went into lockdown, her body began to misbehave and her daily walks and yoga quickly became replaced with sofa bound days of constant and crippling pain. After months of doctor dismissals and misdiagnosis, it was a chance run in with an aunt that helped Grace to discover she was suffering from fibromyalgia. The relief of having a diagnosis pushed Grace to address years of personal trauma, which she believes was manifesting itself as fibromyalgia. And so she set out on a journey of therapies and treatments to simultaneously deal with pent-up emotions and the physical pain. Grace credits a combination of tapping therapy, homeopathic remedies, a very revealing palm reading, and even talking to her legs with helping her to rebalance both her mind and body. So that she now lives a relatively pain-free life and daily walks are very much back on the agenda. Grace, thank you so much for joining me this morning. I am very jealous that you're talking to me from Mallorca. Um, For everybody listening, Grace is a chef and she lives on the Spanish island of Mallorca. And by most people's measurements, you have a pretty wholesome life of walking, hiking, foraging for delicious, nutritious foods and cooking at your family restaurant, um, which is kind of why I like, really wanted to get you on this podcast, because I guess from an outsider's point of view, you seem so healthy and you look great. And so I was really surprised when I found out that you had suffered with fibromyalgia and then we got chatting and you'd been on this really interesting journey of kind of self-medication and pain management. Um, so I think yeah. you've got a really kind of interesting, positive take on it, which I think would be great to share with the community. So let's start at the beginning. So you were feeling kind of all fit and healthy. And then was it out of the blue that you suddenly started feeling different? Yeah, I think I started, um, I was in New York and I was walking a lot because it was in February and and I started getting a really sore lower back and between my shoulders started aching, but I didn't really think anything of it. And I thought it was just my hiking boots weren't supporting me. And um, I was walking too much. But then I went home luck- to England just before lockdown. Mm-hmm. And within like, a few days, um, I started really, really, really aching. And I had absolutely no energy. And I just thought I had some kind of flu Um but I also was off the back of a really busy, intense summer the restaurant the summer that we opened, and I think possibly it was a delayed yeah. physical exhaustion from that. Um, but yeah, I just I, I lost all of my head, began to ache all over. So that was the kind. Of, initially, it was just aching and feeling really. Um, I don't know if listless is the right word, but just 
I would have to, I would track for like 20 minutes from, with my mum in her studio and then have to walk back home and go to sleep. And it was just really... Um, Extreme fatigue. Yeah, and completely out of character. I'm like a bit of a jack-in-the-box usually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it was kind of really getting in the way of your day-to-day life? Yeah, and weirdly and fortunately for me, it coincided with lockdown in England so that I wasn't really able to do anything anyhow. Um, so, but I really wanted to be outside walking. Like, I really, walking's my best thing ever. Yeah. And doing yoga and all of that kind of thing really helps me and my mum. And, and suddenly I wasn't able to do those things, which was, and we were stuck at home. But I was in the countryside, so it was all right, but... I don't, then it did start to get quite a lot worse and like I would wake up in the morning and when I sat up in bed, like the aching was quite extreme and so I went to the doctor and they just said at the beginning um, that they think that he thought I'd been over-exercising, like walking too much. Right. And then tested strain injury in my hips. Is it my hips? Is that where it was, right, in your hips? Such a weird place to ache. Oh, I know. Yeah, aching your hips. Um... So, yeah, and then it just got worse and worse and worse, and then I wanted to see a physio, but there was no, because it was locked down, so there was no physios, and, and then the aching just got so much worse, and I was trying to help in the little village garden, um, and I was, you know, water, doing really basic things like watering and picking lettuces, and in the end, I actually couldn't really do it, the pain would just make, but I, it would just make me cry, oh, you know, God. just bend that lettuce, which sounds, it's the nothing. So that's quite scary. So were you taking any medication for the pain, like just like over-the-counter pharmaceuticals? No, nothing, because I'm one of those really annoying people who doesn't like medicine, but just... Yeah. Um, they like taking And so, no, I didn't. And then I started taking people and just really want, wondering what the hell was going on. By that point, it was like a month in, and I, I was really bored. Yeah. Um, all over, like all between my shoulder blades and my hips kind of clicked a bit. It was really weird. And um, So what were you doing? Were you Googling symptoms? You'd seen your doctor yeah. once and they'd kind of turned you oh, away? Totally. I thought I had Lyme's disease maybe because all of the symptoms were for Lyme's, which is really common. Yeah. Um, and then I got the blood tests. Because I went back to the doctor and I said, not repetitive strain injury. No, I've really done nothing for nearly a month. And it still really hurts, and he checked my joints, and then he gave me loads of blood tests, and they all came back, like, completely funny, mm-hmm. and that was, like, really unsettling, because then I was worried, like, then my mind just went crazy, and I thought, like, what kind of weird, I don't know, bone conditions, yeah. and, like, strange kind of blood, because it, it was in all of me, like, it, it, my fingers hurt, and by then, all of my arms, like, all, my bones felt really brittle, Oof. Like, really fragile and it was just really in contrast to how I've always felt which is strong yeah yeah so then this is what what about a month of being kind of intense pain tiredness not knowing what was going on and And so and more sorry maybe like six or seven weeks of not being in pain then I um then one day I just completely broke down in the garden of that, where of, I was... Of exhaustion and just fed of, up. Of, I was tired of being in pain. Yeah. So tired of being in pain. And um, I was so frustrated that I couldn't do anything and, like, watching my mum and sister go out walking each day and I was just up at home in our tiny little cottage and I just... Then I... Then, by chance, my aunt was driving by and was, like, waving over the garden fence and I was just bawling <laughs> Like, what's going on? And came in and to the garden. And strangely, she actually suffered with fibromyalgia, but I'd never really given it much attention because I didn't really know what it was. I didn't really understand it. And she would come over. She suffered badly for three years. Right. And really couldn't get out of bed for a bit. Anyhow, she just looked at me and she's like, I know what's happening with you. I've, and I just, and I, I know what's happening and I understand how you're feeling. And that was a real turning point for me because I felt like I wasn't... Because it ha- it's so boring to wake up every morning in a small house with the same people and then be like, how are you? How do you sleep? And just... 
I just wanted to cry. I yeah. Just, I thought, like, I don't even want to tell you how I am because it's so boring. Cause it's, yeah, I'm still in agony. For, like, but she had, she knew and had experienced it. And then that's when I realised that the huge amount of it is very emotional. Then my mum was there. And then we just started talking and I stuff and I just kind of said to my it was also a lot of the intensity of lockdown. Yeah, of course. In your family, you're confronting loads of things which are just unavoidable. And um, and I think there was a lot that had to be spoken about between me and my mum and my sisters. And we had this big, like, session with my aunt and uncle <laughs> mediate the garden. Like, just, it was really great. That I felt um, a bit of relief. And then I started Okay. Doing, yeah. So... Um, yeah, because there are bodies of research that fibromyalgia is kind of trauma withheld in the body. So do you think it potentially could come as a kind of like cocktail of working really hard during the summer, lots of family issues that needed to be resolved and that was kind of manifesting itself as pain? Do you think there is truth in that? I 100% um, I couldn't believe anything more strongly. Yeah, I think it was years and years of pain that I hadn't addressed mm -hmm. that was patent in me and then the emotional exhaustion of the restaurant which was completely amazing but also way more way too much work my body and in in the moment you don't have time to realize because there's no option but to get up the next morning and do it all over again but I think the toll it takes on your body you're always gonna there's always gonna be it's going to come out of you somehow yeah, yeah. Just for the listeners, so Grace was running a restaurant what seven days a week for like five months, yeah. breakfast, lunch, and supper. The only chef. Yeah, like sixteen hours a day on my feet in the in the heat of Mallorca, and it was amazing and really fun at times. And but it, we just were so unprepared when we opened that we were just we'd never opened a restaurant before, <laughs> and we were just running just like crazy people and really really busy because the world was still wide open and the tourists were flooding in and it was just a lot to handle um and yeah I think that was just too much for me and mm, yeah but then realizing that possibly there was something emotional going on led me to go and do what I'd been putting off for ages which was to see my mum's friend who's a tapping therapist okay so that was is that your first kind of alternative remedy that you tried yeah definitely so the first that's what I tried the first, and actually at exactly I just went in after I my aunt and I then went to the doctor and again and said like I I called him and I said I just do you what do you think my friend who's just graduated as a doctor said I don't know if there's anyone said this to you but you probably sounds like you have fibromyalgia and I called the doctor and yeah you know we don't like dolling that out as, yeah. as but pretty much yeah and so then I started seeing what I could do and Melanie mum's friend who's the tapping therapist I went to see her like twice a week every week for eight or nine weeks and just floods of so for the uninitiated out. what is tapping therapy it's it's um it's therapy where you're so you're sitting opposite the therapist and you're, you're looking at each other, you're talking like you would in a normal therapy session, but at the same time you're tapping different um, points on your body along like energetic kind of lines that run around your body. And by tapping, there's like some on the side of your hand, on the side on the side of your body, and you tap the sides of your fingers, or your cheekbones, or your, your eyebrows, and generally you start... Oh, what is it? Yeah, tapping your chin. I know. I think you start tapping your chin, but the idea is that as you speak, you're tapping these points on your body, which is disrupting the way your body's storing the the, the information. So, say you, I'm really sad because the dog bit me. I'm really sad because the dog bit me, and you can run that around and around and around. But then, if you tap, it's interrupting how that is stored within. So you're talking about all the different things that come into your head or the pain you've experienced or the emotional things that have happened to you or your childhood and I don't know exactly why you tap where you tap or how Melanie would be talking to me and she tap she is tapping okay so you're copying the therapist I mirror her mm -hmm. so as I walk I'm tapping the side of my 
if Melanie starts tapping her eyebrow, I too start tapping my eyebrow, but I can Okay, so tapping therapy. So you're sat there mirror mirroring your therapist. Yeah. Talking about anything and everything. Yeah, about childhood or how, but a lot of, or, yeah, all the normal things that you could talk to your therapist about. But what was also really interesting is that we, because of the aches and pains that I was having, we would talk to the pain. So we okay. would talk to my legs, you know. Oh, so how do you do that? So you go, legs, like, please stop legs. hurting. You'd say... Great, so how, how are you feeling? And I, oh, I'm all right, but my legs are really hurting. Ah, uh-huh, your legs are really hurting. Tell me about that. What, what, what is hurting about your legs? And I would have to really think, the lower half of my leg is really aching. And she would repeat, the, that is what she also does. Like, ah, oh, the lower half of your leg is aching. And, and she, what do you want to say to the lower half of your leg? So it's pretty, you know, nutty. You can feel a bit nutty. But <laughs> it's crazy at the same time because the pain really momentarily dissipate or lessened as you're talking okay so in that moment the pain is lessened but also afterwards like I would go in hardly being able to sit because my lower back was so sore and 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 leave with a really sore back but not as bad as it was when I came in and it was about like quite a lot of releasing um Releasing, I think, emotional and physical traumas that were in different parts of your body. And also the thing that was related to my legs was that I used to get this rushing in my legs when I, when I, my parents were fighting or when I was feeling sad. My legs would rush with adrenaline. Okay. My legs, as you, as I talked about these things, my legs would rush. So then you're tapping into the... It's kind of reli- reliving that trauma. Yeah. And then you, and then you start talking to the rush, talking to your legs and... Yeah, so there was a lot of that and a lot of crying, and I'm not really very cry, um, but you just, I just wept, um, and. And so, how lo- how long did you see her for? Once, twice a week for. Twice a week for maybe eight or nine weeks, I think, until I then had to come back to New York. But the whole time, my my huge fear was coming back to the restaurant because. Yeah was petrified about being in the same position as I was the first year that we opened. And I don't, like, mean petrified like you. I really was genuinely terrified about finding myself in that kind of whirlwind of the restaurant and not being able to... being out of control and being unable to stop it. And um, so that was a really big thing, like, in the dates changing as to, like, when I could fly and when we could open. And that was this ever changing like deadline and and I had to do a lot of work on like how I was going to protect myself within yeah that so had you been seeing her via zoom I saw her in person okay I don't it's illegal but no I well, maybe it was illegal actually <laughs> um, but it was just me and her yeah in, in I'm sure I'm sure it wasn't if you're allowed to see you're allowed to see doctors and things um yeah. And then, so did she give you things to put in place for when you were on your own? Not really, but she did tell me to talk to my legs, which was really amazing, because I often... (laughs) And that's a huge... That's a very crazy thing. I don't know. But it really does help. Um, And the pain kind of started to lessen, and and then the emotional... uh, Oh, and alongside this, I went to see this lady called Debbie Ricks, who I called Dorset Holistic Healing or something. And she has this thing called the black box, where you send off a swab of your mouth and a piece of your hair, and she feeds it into this machine, which then feeds back information about your body, your organs, your emotions, your... It's quite extraordinary. Kind of like a full health diagnosis. In her, um, and without ever seeing her, Zoom, you never see her. As in, you don't have a Zoom call. Whilst she's getting the results, and she just knew everything about my body and knew I was aching and knew like I was ex- really exhausted, like dangerously exhausted, and all of these things. And she prescribed me a homeopathic remedy and different, um, like a really intense course of magnesium bath salts and just all sorts of remedies to try and get my hormones in the right place but to also rid my body of toxicity which I think 
what the bath salts was really significant for. And so I was doing that, and the, then she put me on diet, which was an anti-inflammatory diet. Okay. My body. So what did that consist of? Um, I think I wasn't allowed any dairy, and I wasn't allowed any of the nightshade family, like no aubergines, peppers, tomatoes, because those are notoriously inflammatory. So if there's anything that's hot or uncomfortable in your body or your joints, generally diet-wise, they'll take those away from you, and, and gluten and dairy. And so I did that, and I it was a huge, I, it was a massive thing for me after not after a month or so. Um, so a combination of the tapping therapy. A non an anti inflammatory diet and magnesium baths. Yeah, and the homeopathic breath that I was taking and a really strong course of um, probiotics in my stomach because I think I whatever I think everything was just so, so out of balance and my stomach bacteria was out of balance and that's like increasingly what people are talking about that being so significant yeah. and um for all, you know, gut and mental and health. And then I also went to see um, an uh, like a energy healer, which I didn't find that great actually. But I did go and see, or not see, but consult a palm reader where you send her photographs of your two palms. Oh and yeah. You and then you have a telephone call with her, and that was really strange because she, I didn't say a thing. I've got it recorded. I listened to it quite a bit. Okay, so you literally um, just send pictures of your palms. Each hand and, and your face. And do you send anything saying, I'm in a lot of pain, so I nothing. want to know why? Nothing. Nothing. And you don't, I didn't say anything. And she just read me like a book and talked to me about me and life and my family and my... And I felt, I felt so held by that. I felt really... Like there was something a lot bigger than me in the pain I'm feeling, and that something much greater that was watching and there with me and the world. And I don't know, it was really significant to me that because I just felt like a smaller, small piece of the puzzle, and that it wasn't forever what I was feeling, and that I wasn't alone in the in. I guess all of the emotional stuff that had got me to this place where I was completely crippled by yeah. my... And I just felt like someone who could see that. As in, did that have a physical effect then once she'd, once she'd, once you felt seen? Did she then, did the pain kind of, did you feel a release? Yeah, it did. It also just helped me feel like it, the future wasn't going to be so scary and that the future was going to be lighter. And the future was going to be more, like she said a lot, like it's going to be lighter and it's not going to be as heavy and things are going to change. And I, I really hadn't said anything. And That's insane. She knew, yeah. And I just, I guess I really was in a place where I really wanted help and I wanted hope. And she, yeah. at, at, at no point did I say that I was ill. It wasn't like he was bigging me up because he knew that I was in agony. Um, so that was just like another thing which I did, which I really, really enjoyed. And, um, and were, the, were these people that you've been seeing, were, did they ever say, actually, we've seen people that have similar, um, like, physical Debbie, physical pain? Yeah, Debbie did. Um, I don't, I think Melanie, my tapping therapist, had seen someone with it before, but also what I'd had for years was my periods had stopped for like seven years and Melanie the tapping therapist she because she's also my friend every time I saw her she would say when are you coming to see me you know I can help you yeah and I say nah no 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 it's fine it's fine they'll come back um and so that's just a, that was another way of my body showing me that things were not okay you know like little signs that things aren't all right and then yeah and is, are they better now yeah completely so it's just it's this unblocking and kind of recircuiting and rerouting your body and calming it like really calming it and and really allowing your body to feel held and heard and not just keep on shoving shit down your throat and like being i it just was really interesting 
brought to a complete full stop, especially I felt like I was a pretty healthy person, but I wasn't looking after myself at all. Like I was really beyond, beyond. And, um, was there a kind of revelatory so, so, moment when you woke up and kind of bounced out of bed and were like, I can go on a long walk or I can do yoga this morning? No, there really wasn't. It was really, really gradual. And, and now even still, often my lower back hurts a bit, but not nothing like as before. And that might just be I have a bad lower back, but it was like the beginning of it before. But um, no, there was no big, big moment. I think... Probably this summer when we were working, but I was having a lot of as well, and I was enjoying myself when I was tired, but I felt like I was doing good by myself, as well as doing all the work that I had to do, and I think that was a really good feeling. So do you think this combination of therapy this has kind of made you understand your body more so that you will stop yourself from pushing yourself too far, or you'll know that actually you need to cut out? dairy for a while and kind of recalibrate yeah completely and and I, I actually feel like that now we, like I just need to keep on going back and spending a few days being just like I, I feel like my body stopped trusting me mm-hmm. and um, I need to just give it the attention it deserves because for whatever reason even though I'm supposed to be quite a healthy person <laughs> I'm like weak Apparently, yeah. <laughs> no. You're the hel- you know, you're the healthiest person I know. Yeah, but not weak. Just like I don't have a lot of backup in me. Don't know. But yes, it really is quite humbling to realise that you can't just keep on pushing. Yeah, it's amazing. And as a um, chef, then, because yeah. lots of people say that changing their diet is one of the biggest factors in managing their pain. Are you now more conscious in your in what you're cooking and what ingredients you use in what the effect that they have on the body? Are there things that you consciously try and eat every day because you know that they will be nourishing your body and nurturing your soul? Yeah, definitely. And so much. I mean, I was already pretty obsessed with good food, but now I notice more that are hard to digest and find myself talking to friends who about things that they find hard to digest. And so what kind of things are they? So boring. We talk about things that are difficult to digest. <laughs> um, but like, friends will come to me and talk to me about, I don't know, like the nightshade family. I now know that if I eat red peppers or aubergines, I get a really sore. And I think I'm just getting to a stage where I no longer even want that for myself. You know, when you're younger and you're like, oh, that really gives me a sore tummy, but yeah. I really want to eat. And I think now I get to a stage where I don't really want to feel the bad effects of food because I know now I know what's feel not. I just want to feel as good as possible, as much as possible, just because it's kind of nicer. I no longer um, want to feel uncomfortable in my belly because it affects my head so much. Yeah. And I, I was cooking this weekend actually for a lady who's living and she has like an autoimmune disorder because she eats a paleo diet and that helps her live her life really so paleo uh, is raw food uh, like you, you can't eat dairy and you can't eat grains um it, but you can eat like meat and fish and nuts and vegetables it's like you're a kind of hunter gatherer without any way of storing food and and so she's found that as a way of helping her live her life and my sister's boyfriend also went to see he suffered really terribly with a bad stomach and he's got attention deficit and he's, you know, crawls up the walls and he went to see Debbie, the lady who you send the hair and yep. swabs. She put him on a diet and he is just loving life and feels amazing and his head is so focused and clear and he's, I, I think the completely transformative effect of your diet is just, it, it's it's fascinating, isn't it? and really, if we think about it, it's such a simple thing that people can implement. Everyone. Yeah, but I guess it is about going on a bit of a journey, for want of a better word, of well, finding out what works for your body and what like your body needs to be looked after, because it will be totally different for everybody. Completely. It will be completely different for everyone, but there are also a handful of really obvious things which everyone can do, like 
to stop eating dairy, wheat, and um, refined sugar or something. Like, that will instantly... They're all the good things. Yeah, but then you start finding good stuff, things that were also really plain and boring to you because fruit becomes sweeter. And yeah. Like, you you have so much energy and you aren't so swollen. And I, I think you can cut those things out and then slowly reintroduce things and just, like, have a listen to how your body responds to, the, to what you're reintroducing and see what works for you and what... I, did, I think listening, once you start listening to your body, it's quite exciting. It's mm. really is like, <laughs> feeling good and feeling, seeing your face in the morning when you wake up and you know you've been really good to your days. And I don't know, that, I, that rewarding and feeling good is increasingly becoming something I'm really um, keen on. <laughs> of course. And you're looking great. So do you think that potentially... Do you feel kind of better kind of in your mind and your body than maybe you did even before all of this started? Because you've now addressed everything. Completely. I feel a lot better. A lot better. I wish that I'd done therapy before because possibly it didn't need to happen if I'd done it and if I hadn't stashed all that stuff away inside me and then opened the restaurant and all of it just came at once. But, um, yeah, I don't know. But I feel really sane and clear-headed or I mean not like a I'm still completely human and have errors or like don't feel brilliant all the time but relative to the kind of fog I've been in for probably quite a few years before I'm feeling really really good and yeah in charge of my mind and body and that's a really good thing to feel Oh, I'm so pleased you're feeling and looking so happy and healthy. And it's kind of such a positive story for people listening that with something like fibromyalgia. And also it was kind of, there was an element of luck that you happened to see your aunt who then gave you a label for something that you could then start exploring. Um, But that it really, it really is worth exploring different options that are kind of outside of the norm um and listening to your body and figuring out what works for you and it seems like it has really worked for you and you do seem happy and healthy and on top of your body's pain I think I was really lucky to have my aunt because it meant that I didn't feel like a crazy person because I think you can feel like a crazy person you've got no symptoms no one can see anyone and you just oh feeling really depressed of pain and it becomes really boring yeah, an element of people, yeah, people not believing you just every day. Yeah. Being, I'm tired, I need to sit down. So frustrating, right. one of these hidden illnesses. Yeah, completely. Like, you've become moany, moany housemate. Like, that's still hurting. And, and, and the fear of being undiagnosed, the fear of not knowing what's wrong with you. Like, now it's been a year, and so I can't even remember. But I remember being so scared. Yeah. And thought of, for fear of what was happening. And, you know, and that's really horrible. Really totally, nice. especially on your Googling symptoms and you're kind of, you know, ring an ambulance, you're dying immediately. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you have figured it out. And yeah. it seems like, yeah, you've got a lot of things in place and a lot of good advice for people. And it's about listening to your body. Yeah, I really can't recommend tapping enough and and the diet. Someone like Debbie, um, they were both amazing. Those were the two that made me better for sure. So it's Debbie Ricks and what was the name of the tapping woman? Melanie Hammett. I don't know what her practice is called. It's in in Dorset, near Bridport. Oh, we'll link them in the show notes for anybody that is interested in exploring their services thank you so much grace you're probably going to make us really jealous with your afternoon plans no it's cold and windy but i'm gonna go walking (laughs) okay good we like to hear that well keep safe and healthy and happy thank you it's so nice to talk to you thanks for having me pleasure the content on this podcast is for informational purposes only and because each person is so unique please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions.